Hello and welcome back to Ave Imperator Productions. Today we'll be continuing our look at absurdity through the lens of nuclear grand strategy. So now we're going to take a look at one of the most influential thinkers of the time who directly influenced the concept of national grand strategy and sort of came up with the constructs for mass war between superpowers that still exists to this day. His name was Thomas Schelling. Thomas Schelling was a social scientist in the 50s and 60s and even up until quite recently. He received a Nobel Prize in 2005 in economics which was specifically for adding to the knowledge of game theory. Which is quite interesting because Thomas Schelling didn't so much despise game theory as it was that he did not truly believe that it represented facts in the idea that it was a supposed rational planning of potentially irrational creatures being man. He did say that it had some utility in overall conceptions and crafting of strategy, but he famously stated that it had no more uh, interaction with these developments of strategy than Latin grammar or astrophysics. So he wasn't too hot on it, which is kind of funny that he ended up getting the Nobel Prize for it. But Thomas Schelling uh, started out with nuclear strategy and he quickly became one of the most out-of-the-box sort of thinkers on the topic. He met up with the Rand Corporation in the mid to late 1950s, and the Rand Corporation was a think tank that was dedicated to determining potential uses of nuclear weapons and the course of what was expected to be almost inevitable nuclear war. Many of their most famous researchers um, did not share the same sentiments as Shelley did. One man had written a book on thermonuclear warfare and it was described as an expertise manual on how to plan, enact, and justify mass slaughter. He was seen as a very sort of crazy guy, and in another book that he wrote, he actually had a 50-point plan on what should happen during a nuclear war, and on step 15 out of 50, total nuclear launches on both sides occurred. So there was almost 30 steps after launching all of your nuclear weapons where the nuclear war would continue. He was famous for thinking that there could be victory in nuclear apocalypse, which is not something that Thomas Schelling agreed with. Schelling was very interested in complex interactions and attempting to model ideas in a sort of making rational of the irrational, and he succeeded in a quite fantastic way. There was a couple of problems that Schelling needed to address. First of all, it's important to note, Thomas Schelling had no military history, he was never a soldier, he didn't go to West Point, anything like that. He was purely a social scientist who was deeply interested in the interactions between different human beings. Schelling did, however, manage to flip grand strategy and nuclear strategy and the way that military thought about engaging in conflicts completely on its head. Previously, for just about all of human history up to the advent of thermonuclear weapons, the point of the military was to engage with another military. You wanted your army to go up against theirs to be victorious, and then for the politicians to, from both sides to interact with each other to force some kind of peace. This would no longer be the case. The military was no longer in the game as far as Thomas Schelling was concerned, of prosecuting war against another opponent. There was another use for the military that had been used in some situations but wasn't entirely the point. The other use for the military is to inflict pain, suffering, 
and dread. Sure, you can get your military and you can wipe out your enemy's cities, but that wouldn't really give you a total victory, would it? Well, it wouldn't unless they were actively doing the same thing against you. So, thermonuclear warfare became less about achieving specific militaristic ends and more about inflicting as much pain and suffering as humanly possible against your opponent. Why would this be important? Well, as Schelling and many other uh, social scientists deeply believed, human beings desperately want to avoid suffering in themselves at the very least. So a person doesn't want to suffer if there's an opportunity for them not to suffer. That includes politicians, that includes states, that includes organizations of people as well. So by repurposing the military to not be about engaging in warfare, but to be specifically about causing suffering, and your opponent to do the same, it could lead to a mitigation overall of necessary conflict. Because neither side wants to suffer themselves, and both sides have the ability to cause untold suffering on the other, each side would necessarily back off, leading to deterrence. There was one other problem that Thomas Schelling wanted and successfully addressed. That was the concept of strategy at a lower level. The old way of thinking about strategy was that you wanted to gain control in an area and minimize control of your opponent. But the more control you have in a nuclear capable uh, military force against another one, the less credible your threats will seem. If you're perfectly capable of launching a nuclear strike and threaten to do so and then don't, your threat is incredible. So because of this, Schelling decided that the purpose of strategy on a lower level should be the total opposite. It shouldn't be about gaining control, it should be about losing control. This leads into a concept that Karl von Clausewitz um, went over a little bit in his On War book, which was the preeminent book on prosecuting warfare leading into World War I. He came up with a concept known as friction. And to him, friction was a bad thing. Friction was the poor, uh, it, it was several different things. It was anything that led to a loss of control on the battlefield from the general or field commander's standpoint. It was a poor chain of command, the time it took to issue orders, men having poor morale and breaking, um, exchanges between the different nations taking too long or faltering, anything that makes the victory harder to achieve, in his mind, was friction. And for Thomas Schelling, this was a good thing. This has to do with the fact that if you threaten, you don't have to threaten thermonuclear war if it is perceived that any event can lead from small-scale events, small-scale contained wars, and inevitably end up at large thermonuclear exchanges. So the concept was that you don't want to start aggression because if you do, we'll do one more thing, and then you'll do one more thing, and then maybe a bad command comes out and we have to react to that, and then maybe one of your communications takes too long and you have to react to that. And it slowly boils up to the point where all of a sudden you're in another grand war. So any small event between the two major powers necessarily needed to be mitigated or to be altogether done away with for the fear of escalation from a small conflict into a large thermonuclear war. Schelling had a very interesting uh, way of showing how this would work on a sort of small scale. Schelling was very into analogies and I think that this will sort of help put it into perspective. I'm gonna throw it up here for a second. The idea is that you have it's a thought experiment. You have two young adolescent men, and they're both in cars, and they have a whole group of friends around them. The idea is that they both get into the cars, and they're going to drive straight at each other, and neither one of them wants to hit. If they both run into each other, that's a total failure, and everybody loses everything. If guy one makes guy two swerve, then guy one looks tough and gains credibility and his friends like him more, and guy two looks weak and looks like 
he, he loses credibility in the eyes of his peers. If both swerve, nothing is lost, but there's no way for the two to communicate with each other on what exactly they're going to do. So the idea was, before you get into the car, how do you convince the other guy that he needs to swerve and that you're irrational and not capable of being read? He came up with several different little ideas. You could feign drunkenness. You could pretend like you don't know what's going on. You had to do something to show that you were not in a rational state and that you were not capable of being rationally examined. This necessity for irrationality came from Schelling's concept of this new friction, where any minor event would have both parties necessarily need to swerve in the idea of not engaging in aggression whatsoever for fear of the little events leading to an all-out nuclear Armageddon. Schelling went on to argue that nuclear strategy was not about victory, it was not about the decisive victory that had tantalized military theorists for centuries, the concept of a sweeping blow, knocking back your opponent, taking what you wanted, and then enacting demands upon them. Nuclear strategy was different. It had to be considered in terms of bargaining and coercion. Bargaining would be very important as if either side decided that they no longer wanted to play the game, so to say. They could easily enact destruction on not only themselves, but also on their opponent. There had to be active communication, although Schelling made clear that communication did not necessarily need to be verbal, although it would become after the Cuban Missile Crisis when the Moscow to Washington uh, direct phone line was set up, but up to this point it was more an idea of pushing up, then pushing up, settling down, seeing where lines of aggression could be drawn, how far you could go, and then finding a river or a border or uh, different areas where you could settle down. We'll look a little bit more at that in a second, but communication was the key as war was no longer two opponents going at it against each other. It was a game of cooperation between two powers which did not like each other, but both wanted to actively attempt to minimize the suffering of themselves and their people. So we're going to take a little look at a specific instance of where this nonverbal communication came into play to make the nuclear deterrent strategy more stable and to make nuclear war overall less possible. So there was two concepts of nuclear strikes and the first one came from the use of conventional weapons and conventional bombing tactics from World War II and it was called first strike capability. First strike capability is where you think that you can preemptively launch your weapons against your opponent, take out their capability, their entire military capability to launch weapons back at you, and then lead in with some sort of invasion or, once they're incapable of retaliation, use that to draw out some kind of demands. The first strike capability was horrendous and it led to a very unstable way of thinking, which I'll try to illustrate. It's something like, he thinks that we think that 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 he thinks that we're going to attack first. So he is going to attack first. So we must attack first. It's a very frenetic concept and the preemptive strike needed to come from either side first, meaning that it could have been completely unpredictable and it was not a very good way of enacting deterrence. There was a study that came out of the RAND Corporation which showed that the US was actually quite vulnerable around 1958 to a preemptive strike and because of this they needed to have some sort of weapons in reserve. Schelling and a few other social scientists worked together and came up with the overall plan of the second strike capability, which was about how you would enact retaliation after a preemptive strike. 
with the advent of nuclear submarines, um, dispersed methods of nukes, moving them around, different things like that to keep them unpredictable. Most nuclear weapons in the United States would become more used for the second strike capability, meaning that they could not be taken out preemptively, and because of that, their capability would only necessarily come to fruition if they were attacked first. There's a second bit to this. The first strike capability was supposed to be entirely focused on military infrastructure. Roads, factories, bomb silos, airports, um, things like that. Because of this, it wasn't quite as dreadful because it appeared more as a military strike and less as just a causing of suffering. The second strike was very different. The point of the second strike was, in the words of Robert McNamara, to destroy up to 25% of the population of the opposing nation and 50% of their infrastructure. These numbers were picked because it was thought that after that you would get such diminishing returns that there wasn't really any point and they'd basically all be gone anyways. So the second strike was, on the one hand, predicated on the idea that you were not going to attack first, and on the other hand, predicated on the idea that your entire goal was to cause as much suffering as humanly possible. And something interesting happened as the United States developed the idea of second strike uh, nuclear warfare and began to deploy this method. The USSR, without being directly reached, without knowing exactly what was happening, started moving away from their first strike capabilities and started themselves embracing second strike capabilities. This displays the uh, nonverbal communication between the two powers. They both agreed to do what would be better for both of them in limiting the capability of the other side to preemptively attack, and also increasing the potential chaos and suffering that would be unleashed. And this is, again, why nuclear warfare is so absurd. The more necessary option, which would make the deterrence strategy more stable and make nuclear warfare less likely, was also the more chaotic option that would cause more human suffering and would more effectively create destruction for both sides. The idea was very similar to the ancient concept of hostage negotiations, where if you have something valuable and it's exposed, you're less likely to do something damaging because you don't want those hostages to be injured in any way. The only difference is, in this case, instead of hostages being close family members or friends or something like that, the hostages were entire cities. It was a very bizarre and abstract kind of warfare. And when one side would do something that lessened the chance of nuclear warfare, often the other side would also do that. This concept of reciprocal action, where the deterrence mechanism would cause one side to back down in a way that also ramped things up was determined by Schelling to be the most direct route to some sort of disarmament, with the idea being that if you disarmed many of yours, that they may feel the need to disarm some of theirs as well because they no longer need to have as massive of a retaliation to your strike. It didn't exactly work out that way, and it is important to note that Schelling did want to disarm nuclear weapons. He was not a fanatic like many of the others at the Rand Corporation who thought that there could be victory after Armageddon. He very much wanted a strategy that would de-escalate, but the only problem was, as stated earlier, any option for de-escalation was Inversely, also the option that would potentially cause even worse consequences. As we know now, it didn't happen, so that's a little bit of a uh, silver lining, but it also displays how these wars, this cold war between the two powers, was an act of cooperation between two belligerents who were both attempting to 
bully or coerce their opponent while also minimize the chance of themselves encountering directly human suffering. Now, I talked a little bit about escalation earlier, and I just want to real quickly go over the concept and how it was shattered and had to be completely rethought through less rational means due to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The process of a conflict becoming more and more intense was referred to as escalation. It's not the best um, word that they could have picked, but you'll see why in a minute. The original idea was that it was like getting on an escalator. Once you started with your limited conflict, it was going to go up, and there was going to be thermonuclear exchanges, and you needed to stay off the escalator so that everybody was fine. The provoking of thermonuclear war was actually the end goal of limited conflicts during the Cold War. It's, there's a, a, a certain kind of expectation that the different little wars that they fought were uh, supposed to be bringing allies in or conquering new territories, and to a certain extent they were, but the number one goal of limited conflicts during the Cold War was the overlooming threat of all-out thermonuclear war from this inevitable escalator of doom. This was a concept that both sides were willing to endure up until the Cuban Missile Crisis. This was the first limited conflict that threatened to escalate very quickly out of control and destroy all parties involved. And yet it didn't. When the... There were several invasions of Cuba, which was an ally of the USSR, and the Cuban government requested nuclear missiles be moved onto their land by the USSR, and by a lot of indications, Nikita Khrushchev didn't really want this for obvious reasons. He was in the same position as John F. Kennedy, just in a very different place and with a very different group of ideologues that he had to contend with. But he had to appease his hardliners and they began moving them in. There were a couple of options. The first was a military strike and an invasion. This was not a very palatable option, especially because Pearl Harbor had happened 20 years ago or less, and the idea was still fresh in the minds of not only the politicians, but the average American. Waking up and hearing that there was a heroic and glorious attack on a naval base in a foreign country that they weren't expecting would draw up images and emotions of extreme negativity as they would simply be doing what the Japanese had done to America, causing um, a lot of frustration. The speechwriter of John F. Kennedy was recorded as saying that he had a very hard time writing a speech about a surprise naval attack, but the second option, which was a naval blockade, he had a very easy time writing about. John F. Kennedy decided to implement a naval blockade and to attempt to stall the movement and even up until that point it was assumed by most of the military strategists and a lot of the thinkers that this was it. They were on the escalator, the bombs had to be taken care of, something had to happen, and it was going to go from a limited war, which it was starting to get into, up until thermonuclear war, and they were preparing invasion plans. There was a lot of uh, John F. Kennedy received a letter from Nikita Khrushchev that said that he had no intention of going to war, and then later in the day, he received another letter from the Kremlin that said that they were going to put the bombs in there and everything was going to happen. They were getting a lot of mixed messages, but in the end, what happened was they came to an agreement where the United States said that they would not invade Cuba, and the USSR, they, they sort of gave them a, um, a guarantee of independence within their realm of influence and the USSR would move out their weapons. And this was when the concept of escalation was destroyed, and why it's not a useful word any longer. Schelling and a few other social scientists came up with a new theory, where instead of one escalator that's continuously going up that you can't stop, you're on an escalator, but there's platforms, and you can get off on the platform to discuss things and have concepts, you can get on another elevator and go down, there's elevators that go across, there's all kinds of elevators everywhere, and none of them necessarily lead to the end goal of thermonuclear war. This 
threw a serious wrench in a lot of the plans that these military strategists and these civilian strategists had because this hard mathematical fact that things had to go this way, that it was a one-way street, that everything was going to end, and that you could have victory in Armageddon, was suddenly turned on its head. With the uh, solution of the crisis of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a landline was connected between Washington and Moscow. Uh, the different heads of state between the two countries would actively communicate from that point on and Thomas Schelling actually quit the nuclear game. He said that at that point he had done what he needed to do, it was no longer interesting to him, and that he could leave it to the other experts. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. This was a shorter series on an introduction to absurdity using the nuclear weapon as the focal point. I'm going to be doing a couple different series coming up. I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go, but I really hope that you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to leave a like. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe. But until next time, remember, have a broader.